Hello, my name is Tabitha Stein. I'm the Director of Technical Marketing at the American Institute of Steel Construction. At AISC, our Steel Solutions Center is always capturing what are those innovative concepts, ideas, even the updates that we're informing you of. Updates to the Code of Standard Practice in 2016, the new specification coming out. Also, what are some new design guides, new technical tools that you could put in your back pocket? Also, what are the new systems that are out there? Whether it's multi-story residential construction that can help achieve low floor to floor height using structural steel, to new material grades. Structural steel is always available as the material of choice for applications ranging from a wide variety of projects. Also, what's new in sustainability? How do you work with your structural steel fabricator? These are just some examples of the innovations you can utilize on your next project. AISC's Steel Solution Center is a one-stop shop for yourself, your project team, to ask questions, provide to, for us to provide assistance to you, to balance ideas also, off of, also for your next project. Some people reach out to us when they're approaching a project such as a parking structure and they're currently looking at a competing material, and they're really trying to provide viability for an alternate system possibly proposed in structural steel. For the last 15 years, AISC Steel Solution Center has worked on over 900 projects around the country. Those 900 projects have provided a wealth of data for different types of project applications where we're available to provide valuable, innovative ideas based off past project successes and explorations to better assist you on your job. Even if you have a simple question regarding our technical documents on how to apply steel or how to apply the specification to your job, we're here to help as well. With nearly 150 questions per week coming into the Solution Center, we're here to assist. In addition to our Steel Solution Center staff in Chicago, we have regional representatives positioned all around the country that come out and give technical presentations um, on different innovations as well as specific discussions about your project. So I would like to remind you that this is a service that we provide. Anything that you have um, that sounds interesting today, we can definitely come and talk more detailed about um, in your specific office, whether it's architecturally exposed structural steel, or a specific sustainability, or how can I use a hybrid solution of steel with, with possibly wood um, on my next residential project. And that's here where we're available to help you out. Steel Day is a day that we celebrate all around the country where we take a time to step back and say, how has structural steel made an impact on my project? And let's take the advantage, take advantage of an opportunity to bring in designers, decision makers, into structural steel fabrication shops such as this one or also onto project sites where we can actually touch and feel the structural steel and hear great examples of case studies of projects where things have worked well that I can then replicate that on my next job. So this is an opportunity today to learn about the new innovations that are out there for your specific project needs and to learn a little bit more about what's happening at AISC so that you can take this knowledge back to your office and share it with others that are working in structural steel. The first thing I always like to discuss whenever we're talking about steel, things that happen so quickly and change, is the building construction market. So at AISC, we do a valiant effort in um, actually capturing what is that market. Um, and what we track is really the non-residential construction, so the commercial construction that's happening, plus residential construction greater than four stories. And we really track that movement of the market over time. Um, and what you can see is since 1990 through the end of 2015, um, and what we measure is what is that volume of construction starts happening on a quarterly, which then translates to this annual basis. Um, we currently are around 1.1 billion square foot of construction starts in 2015. Now, that sounds like a great number, but in essence, and comparing to the Great Recession, where we were in late 2008, early 2009, we are definitely nowhere near um, that peak that we saw of nearly 1.7 billion square foot of construction. 
that occurred um, in the peak of 2006, um, 2007. So a lot of times I get questions, people say, when are we going to get back to that level? And I think what we have to realize is this is a new normal. And since 2009, we've been coming out of that trough. Um, but what we've seen is we're probably not going to be going back to those pre-recession levels. And it's important to kind of understand where we are. Um, the, the construction starts are currently down around 2% compared to the 2015 numbers. And we're going to walk through that a little bit more specifically. Now, what's interesting to note is the amount of construction that's happening since the recession is a definitely a different mix of projects. In 2009, um, we had a very small amount of condos, apartments, hotel construction that was going on. The markets that were moving was more federally funded projects. We saw government work moving forward with some of the uh, relief acts that Congress was enabling for government construction. Um, we also saw more and more commercial construction. Now, what we see coming out of this is now a robust growth in residential. So this is that multi-story residential market greater than four stories now encapsulates um, you know, growth per year exceeding about 20% of the previous year. And 2015 end of year actually ended at 13% growth over 2014. Non-residential contracting about 7%. And really what this showcases to you is how the market has grown um, to around that 1.1 billion square foot of construction, but it's an entirely different makeup of what we had five years ago. And that's what's been a challenge is um, project teams doing more condo construction, um, apartment construction. Uh, some of that could entail student housing and hotels and making sure that their business model um, can adapt and the designs that are there for that type of construction. So it's been interesting for the steel industry to adapt to this as well. And we'll go into that in a little bit more. Um, this actually shows you that year over year trends. Um, kind of showing the non-residential construction growth um, between that year and the previous year. So as you can see, since 2010, year-over-year -year growth has went anywhere from 5% to the year-over-year -year, as opposed to almost 50% compared to the previous year. So multi-residential construction continuing to grow, but not at the same pace we saw initially. However, we're still seeing a lot of contraction um, in that non-residential market. So long term, um, we're going to have to wait and see how this pans out. It probably will not continue with the same growth. However, this is the market that we're in currently today. So let's look at where we ended up um, in 2016 first quarter results. Um, and what this shows is the 2016 building construction starts were up 10% compared to the first quarter of the previous year in 2015. Um, part of that, we believe, is because of the very cold weather, cold weather construction issues we had um, in areas such as Chicago um, in the Northeast, where we had some really rough winters in 2014 and 2015 with a relaxed winter in 2016. So overall, construction was able to move a little bit more than it had the previous winter, showing construction up 10% from that previous quarter. Now, what we're seeing then is um, 2016 second quarter, um, we saw it down 2%. And I really think some of that is a lot of those projects in 2015 couldn't start until the second quarter, whereas opposed in 2016, a lot of things started up a little bit early. But overall, as you can see, um, that kind of leveling off that we're seeing, really not anticipating a lot of growth in 2016. <laughs> So let's look at really what is that building construction market um, anticipation of growth. Um, there is still um, an anticipation that we're not at the trough of this, um, this, net, this cycle that we're in currently, that we're still going to anticipate a little bit of growth, um, but not a lot. Um, there's others that forecast, whether it's the AGC, the AIA, um, Dodge, um, that have their own forecasts out there. And we look at those. Um, we also look at those, how they compare to what's happened historically. And we also saw how they modified after our numbers came in in um, the second quarter. So for example, 
the first quarter I said was up 10%. A lot of people looked at that as great growth anticipation moving forward through the rest of 2016. But once we had that little bit of contraction and only up 2% over the same time last year at the end of the second quarter, really everyone kind of pulled back a little bit on their forecasts um, for growth. So what we're anticipating is a little bit of growth happening um, moving forward into 2017 and then it really leveling off um, with a slight dip, um, but not anticipating a huge uh, growth um, or substantial recession moving forward. Now, of course, there's a lot of outside factors that play into this um, in regards to um, U.S., international politics, material availability, um, and some of those outside factors may have an impact in this, but really the trend that we're seeing, we're going to expect a little bit more growth and then kind of stretching that out with a slight dip, um, but not substantial um, downturn moving forward. We also talk to our members. The members of the structural steel industry, such as the steel fabricators that are part of our, um, our strong membership, um, they provide what's called our business barometer on a quarterly basis. And overall, what you can see here is red over blue indicates a little bit of optimism, blue over red indicates a little bit of pessimism. Um, so moving forward into 2016, we're starting to see a little bit more pessimistic views from, views from the fabricators, not a lot of, not as a substantial backlog, um, and that really just kind of gives us a little bit of speculation um, that people are starting to see the little bit of the end of this cycle, possibly with a, a leveling off and a downturn um, moving ahead. We also look at the architectural billing index. So the architectural billing index is a great indicator um, for architectural billings, which really gives you good insight to the amount of work coming forward in the future. And the structural steel industry usually sees this type of work after it's in the architects, three to four, their offices, three to four quarters later, it impacts the fabricators. Um, and what's a little bit of a good sign is we're starting to see um, 50 is kind of a, a no change, and we've seen a lot of bouncing around in relation to 50, but a little bit more on the growth side, which is positive, but not enough to really say that this is a trend moving forward with a lot of design heading our way. So again, just a market indicator that um, things are bumping ahead, moving up and down at the, kind of the same pace we've been seeing with not a lot of substantial growth coming down um, the way as well. Um, similar with the Dodge Momentum Index at the bottom, 100 is your um, um, metric from the year 2000, seeing a little bit of growth, but not a lot of substantial um, for people to really get a lot of, um, you know, uh, clarity and focus for growth moving forward. So what we really kind of putting all of this together and really trying to see how is this going to move forward? Um, we're predicting that 2016 will be up 5 to 7 percent from where we were at the end of 2015. Um, and we're really expecting 2017 to be at a very similar level. Um, so the same amount of construction volume right around 1.2 um, billion square foot of construction at the end of next year. And then that flatness turning into a gentle decline. Um, down to 2018, beginning to decline down for the next few years, possibly with growth after that, but still a little bit um, too far to be anticipated. The colors that are shown here really shows you the mix of the market. Um, as you can see, that red is the apartment construction mixed with dormitories, hotels. Um, those really make a huge percent of the construction that's happening, um, nearly 20% and a growth of over, you know, 17% the year before that, which is substantial. Um, so of course, as we start to see the steady decline, that will be impacted as well. The thing that I think is most interesting um, coming out of this great recession is to be, and it's something that you may be seeing at the type of projects you work on, but the projects that are moving forward. So remember, you just saw the graph where we're coming out of this recession. Um, but, and that, that graph is all based off the square footage of construction starts. So 1.2 billion square foot of construction starts. Now, if we change that and say, let's not look at the number of square foot starting construction, but let's look at the number of projects starting construction, and that's what the red line is. 
And this actually shows a level playing field since 2009. So what that says is we have not started more projects per quarter or per year than we have the year before, where at the same point the square footage is increasing. So what this says is kind of just an interesting showcase of the type of projects moving forward are projects that are larger in scale than projects in the past. So as we steadily have been seeing an increase up to that 1.2 billion square foot of construction, at the same point, we're at a much, much smaller amount of projects being built at around 23 to 25,000 um, projects around the country starting. Um, so those projects are bigger in volume than what we saw before. So again, just an interesting trend that um, the construction volume is growing, but the number of projects technically is not. And another slide I like to showcase is people ask about that prime market um, and how steel compares to the other competing materials. And what's interesting is when, when you look at that non-residential construction market and residential market four stories and above, or greater than four stories, structural steel um, leads the market by 50% market share. Um, concrete's at around 31%, wood at 7%. And this just kind of showcases that we have been the material choice for a number of years. However, this is where it's time for us to look hard at some of those markets that are moving, that residential construction. How can steel be more um, better positioned to provide viable solutions in the condo, apartment, and hotel markets? And that's something that we're going to talk a little bit more about today is gaining more market share in those segments not just with steel alone, um, but some innovations that are out there, even utilizing some of the other competing materials, such as wood, to find a more effective hybrid solution. So this is kind of where we are at the end of the second quarter for market share statistics um, for the types of projects moving forward. In that 1.2 billion square foot, um, of that square footage of construction, structural steel has a 50% market share. So jumping from that, let's jump straight into talking about what's happening in AISC. AISC has been around for over 90 years as the technical authority, um, the authority for which the Code of Standard Practice consolidated the industry in providing um, effective um, processes and codes for efficiencies and um, bringing structural steel tolerances for erection and fabrication um, into a consensus document um, that has standardized the industry over those last 90 years. Um, in addition to the Code of Standard Practice, we have our specification, our structural steel manual, we have seismic provisions, we have our seismic manual, we also have our um, design guides. And a lot of those things are constantly being refreshed and relooked at on various cycles. For example, our specification is on a six-year cycle. Um, in addition to once that comes out, we also then publish our structural steel construction manual. Um, similar with our site and provisions, um, we also have our design guides that are updated on an as-needed basis based off innovations in research and also new topics that are brought to the market. So, things that are happening that are coming out soon. AISC 360, our spec, and both the, that and AISC 303, the Code of Standard Practice, are both coming out this fall, which is very exciting. Later on this year, AISC 341, our seismic provisions will be released. Um, what came out earlier this year, this summer, is our AISC 358 pre pre-qualified connection standard. And then next year, following our spec, we have our 15th edition construction steel construction manual, um, which will be ready to order come summer 2017 with both an ASD and LRFD approach, integrating the updated code of standard practice, integrating the updated um, specification for structural steel. And then following next summer, in the following summer in 2018, will be our third edition seismic design manual, which will include the updated seismic provisions, updated pre-qualified connections, and a lot of great resources as well. So these documents are coming your way. We've also recently published some design guides. Design guide 29 on vertical bracing connections 
Analysis and Design. We also have Design Guide 30, Sound Isolation and Noise Control, so acoustics, um, which has been a topic that we've gotten a lot in um, uh, the Steel Solution Center, um, a great resource also for architects if you have projects with acoustics, understanding how steel compares to other materials. Um, this is a great resource uh, for you even to showcase and share with your architects um, for acoustic control of structural steel buildings. And in our fact series, our fact series are a great resource um, for all parties interested in various topics that don't dive in too technical but really kind of give a primer on topics. Our fourth one entitled Sound Isolation and Noise Control uh, really is a great pair with Design Guide 30 discussing um, acoustics. So the Design Guide 30 is more of an engineer's resource and the FACT series number four is a great primer for building owners, architects, structural engineers um, on commonly um, on common topics related to acoustics and how structural steel can fit into that. We've also are always looking at what are new innovations in research and how do our design guides need to be updated to incorporate those situations. Design Guide 11, I say will be in print this summer, it actually is available now. So Design Guide 11 on vibration, very exciting that that's now available as an AISC member can be downloaded from for free from our website um, or you can order a copy. We also have Design Guide 15 Rehab and Retrofit. That is a very, very common design guide that's referenced and, and consulted with when people call the Steel Solution Center when retrofitting um, existing structures and pulling up old drawings or just trying to figure out what type of alloy your um, supposed steel building is built with based off what year the building is constructed. Um, and it's going to include extensive design examples. Um, on rehab and retrofit with those um, prior sections and alloys, which will be a great resource for people in that arena. We also are working currently in the Solution Center with our staff um, in conjunction with the outside experts on a new revision to steel plate shear walls. Um, steel plate shear walls are a great um, option for high seismic applications, and we're even working in-house on some R equals three solutions for steel plate shear wall. So that's something that's very exciting, taking that high seismic great solution and really bringing it down to reducing your core thickness by using a steel plate shear wall and making that a viable, economical, constructible solution um, in the Midwest in places where um, high seismic isn't governing the use. Um, we also have an update for Design Guide 21 on welding coming out and um, also working with Design Guide 4 and 16 on end plate moment connections, and those are coming. And then new topics coming along the road, which always get people excited. Um, castellated beam design, that's been a topic that's been around, um, you know, castellated beams. I, I know that a lot of us reference the old Blodgett design um, manual or Blodgett book where he has a chapter on castellated beams. Um, and about 15 years ago, a couple producers started streamlining them, bringing them into software. Um, so a lot of software that some of us use has castellated beam options in them. And now there'll be a design guide that addresses castellated beams. So that's going to be a great reference for structural engineers um, to really have an authority on designing the openings, um, pairing um, you know, different member sizes to make a castellated beam and the design considerations that need to be addressed. AISC N690, the appendix N9 on steel plate composite walls. That's exciting. Looking at steel plate um, with a sandwiched composite wall system with concrete. So that's something that's going to be um, coming down the road. Um, also, curved steel design. Curved steel is something that's now um, addressed more in the specification, or excuse me, in the code of standard practice in 2016. So that's something that you'll be able to reference, the tolerances for curved steel. So this design guide references that a little bit more. And also steel stair designs. Um, so designing steel stairs, what are some constraints you need to be aware of? Um, steel stairs occur in almost every type of building that are out there and um, providing a resource for people to design stairs um, is something that we 
we've put together. So let's walk through some of these major changes happening, particularly in the Code of Standard Practice. Now today is meant to be an overview of some of the innovations that are happening in the steel industry in addition to some of the documents that are available from AISC. So today I've just chosen to talk about some basic major improvements to the Code of Standard Practice. Now we could do the same thing and talk about this literally for four hours. We could talk about major changes coming to the code, or to, excuse me, to the specification, to the seismic provisions, to the design guides, each individually. Um, but what I really want to stress is this is an example of the things happening in this document. For a wealth of information about a lot of the other documents that are being updated, every year at the Steel Construction Conference, NASCC, um, we have specialty sessions on a variety of these topics, and I'd encourage you to go to AISC.org slash NASCC to listen to some of the past sessions from this, NA, from this past year's NASCC um, that occurred in Orlando in March, and actually look at some of the um, sessions and listen to some of the innovations happening, for example, um, that are coming out with the specification. You can always reach out to the Steel Solution Center as well, and we'd be glad to talk you through these. In addition to your regional representative, um, the regional engineer is out there in your local area and can walk through any of these things um, that you may have questions on. So today we're going to talk about the Code of Standard Practice. So here are some highlights, um, big things that are happening this year. Um, ANSI, ANSI, it is an ANSI approved document. We're going to talk about models. Um, when we say models, we mean electronic models. And then we talk about stiffening, and with that I mean um, members at connection locations and AESS. So here's four things. I mentioned earlier um, curved steel now has tolerances. That's another thing we could talk about in detail. Um, but here are the four main things that I'm going to discuss on what's new in the Code of Standard Practice. Um, what's interesting now is our specifications. AISC 360 and 341 um, are and always have been um, ANSI approved. So this is the first year that AISC 303, which is our code of standard practice, um, is an ANSI approved document. And that really means it was contrived and worked on by a balance committee, which include seven fabricators, seven engineers, and nine others, which included general contractor, a code official, a quality consultant, an erector, a detailer, an architect, and an attorney. Um, and also a, a big rigorous public review process where ballots were put forth, people could comment, those comments had to be looked at, addressed, um, and a voting process as well. So we're really excited that we're now part of the ANSI Library of Documents um, and that we've got to a major um, revision in our Code of Senior Practice that is um, greatly improved and something that's only going to help improve the construction industry. So let's talk about models. Um, in the past, we had Appendix A, Design, Building, Product Models. And it really said, um, in this appendix, shall include um, when the contract documents indicate that a 3D building model replaces contract drawings, and it is to be used as the primary means of designing, representing, and exchanging structural steel data from the project. Um, that's now going away. Appendix A is now deleted. And we have new terms throughout to generalize all provisions to meet, to treat paper drawings and the models equally. So for example, here's some new terminology. When the term erection documents is used, that really means the erection drawings or where the parties, parties have agreed in the contract documents to provide digital models, the erection model. So the document can be in either drawings or model, and a combination of drawings and models also may be provided. So these are specific improvements to the terminology so that they can kind of be used interchangeably based off the specific project. And when you say erection model, this is defined by a dimensionally accurate 3D digital model produced to convey the information necessary to erect structural steel. This may be the same as the digital model as this may be the same digital model as the fabrication model, but is not required to be. So again, 
think about this whenever relating these terms to how they apply um, for your project specific deliverables. Um, models versus drawings, or models versus documents, um, or possibly a, co a conglomeration of both. Same thing for approval do documents. And it also goes into that bottom bullet point, levels of development. The levels of completeness of the design of the digital models and digital model elements. So really specifying what is your LOD um, in more, um, more detail and really explaining the specifics of that. Um, so let's talk about another big thing, stiffening. Um, so this is a, an example of a connection that you would see on a plate, or excuse me, on a uh, design drawing where you're showing um, this connection with a single web plate connection. Um, you have bolted top and bottom flanges. And to actually develop this moment, you're saying um, a note here on the column that continuity and doubler plates as required. And so this is a very um, kind of a loosey-goosey approach to, well, depending on how you need to develop that load, you may need continuity and doubler plates. And that's really the challenge that people have had for a while is how to handle that. So if you remember back in 2010 with the updated code of standard practice, um, option three was proposed um, whenever talking about who's going to, um, it's called the delegated design of, of, of connections. And option three stated, in the structural design documents or specs, the connection shall be designated to be designed by a licensed engineer working for the fabricator. So that was kind of the, the third approach that you could do is having a fabricator um, who, or excuse me, a licensed engineer who works for the fabricator as a connection designer. Um, so what we've done with this is essentially improved it by now offering option 3A and 3B. Because of the elusive wording of doubler plates as required, um, at bidding time it's a struggle for the fabricator to understand um, before they've designed the connections, um, are doubler and stiffener plates going to be required? How much plate's going to be used? How is that going to impact my bid? So now you can actually state these two subsidiary options of, of, of option three, 3A and 3B. 3A states member reinforcement at the connection, so really talking about doublers and stiffener plates, shall be designed by the owner's designated rep for design as shown in the structural design documents issued for bidding so that the quantity, detailing, and fabrication requirements for member reinforcements shall be readily understood. So essentially what you're saying is the fabricator who works for the for the excuse me the engineer who works for the fabricator is going to be responsible for the connections. However, the member reinforcement has already been designed and is part of that bidding quantity. If not, you can use option three B, which states the owner's designated rep for design shall provide a bidding quantity of items required for member reinforcement action connections with corresponding project specific details that show the, con the, con the conceptual configuration of reinforcement appropriate to the magnitude of, of forces to be transferred. Um, these quantities and project-specific con conceptual configurations will be relied upon for bidding. Now, if no quantities for these things are shown, member reinforcement at the connections will not be included in the bid. So, you cannot keep leaving that elusive note that says it may be required. You really need to state what the quantities are so that bids can be done appropriately. And if they're not, then the fabricator will not be assuming that as part of their bid. So this is a little bit of a clarification to help at those areas where connections interface with columns that may need stiffening to develop the load. So. The fourth thing that I want to talk about is architecturally exposed structural steel. AESS has been a hot topic ever since probably 2002-2003 when we started talking about it in this insert shown on the left from Modern Steel Construction, our monthly publica publication. Um, that product was a byproduct of two groups, the Structural Engineers Association of Colorado, working with the Rocky Mountain Steel Construction Association in Denver, um, putting together a sample AESS code of standard, or excuse me, a sample AESS specification 
um, also a sample board of connection details, um, and a cost matrix to help better specify the use of AESS on projects around the country. <laughs> What's interesting is in the new AESS um, specification, excuse me, the new Code of Standard Practice document that's coming out this fall, there are major changes to AESS to reflect um, kind of the third version. So version one was what was incorporated um, in that 2003 document. Um, since then, the Canadian Institute of Steel Construction and their Code of Standard Practice has, a, has included a category approach to different categories of AESS. This is essentially version three, building on both of them and really including a more specific approach to um, AESS based off the types of areas that you're working with. So the new section 10 for the Code of Standard Practice, which addresses AESS, breaks them down into various elements. So on your contract documents, you're actually going to specify AESS 1, AESS 2, all the way up through 4, and even breaking it down to AESS custom, something above and beyond a code of standard practice. So the concept is not over-specifying AESS and making sure it's the right type of finish for the right type of application. AESS 1 goes into basic. AESS 2 is Elements viewed at a distance greater than 20 feet, 20 feet, so possibly something on the, the top of a balcony above people's um, eye, eye of vision above 20 feet, um, something on the roof of a structure, um, or only accessible by maintenance workers. And then you also have those elements that are less than 20 feet. And then you have the specific showcase elements um, that we really require a special surface edge treatment um, and then you have what's called AESS Custom. That's really the custom elements that are above and beyond these four categories. And a way to think about this is in terms of dollar signs. Um, sometimes we were seeing projects that they were just call, qualifying them as AESS and saying things like grind welds, all, grind all welds flush. And it was really escalating project costs for, for no real reason in areas that people couldn't touch and feel and see within close vision. So now what we've done is tried to provide different ways to specify different areas of the project by different AESS levels or categories. And really, the more specific stringent categories you have, the more expensive that they're going to be. So what AISC is doing right now is we're teaming up with the Rocky Mountain Steel Construction Association again, 13, 14 years later, to update a specific project, or excuse me, a specific AESS specification that will only provide more valuable tools for you to encapsulate this category approach into your project specs. Um, so available the first quarter of 2017, we plan to have a new presentation that deals just with this approach that we plan to take around the country. We also plan to have a sample specification that you can download from our website at AISC.org slash AESS. And also a cost matrix that looks at all the different categories and also looks at all the different subportions sub of the code of standard practice and say, if I decide to grind weld flush, how much more is that going to add on to my project? And really starting to see the cost ranges based off which categories you approach um, and how the cost implications should translate down to your project. And that will be something that we do by surveying a group of fabricators from around the country to really start seeing um, costing trends um, from various AESS um, decisions that can be made on your project. So look out for something like that company. Um, so what are the things happening in the future? Um, things that we always try to keep on our mind are staying innovative with the times and understanding what research and innovations are out there um, that we need to be um, honing in on, improving on, and really providing research dollars for um, to really provide game-changing information to provide more successful projects. And the three main things that we're working on right now is fires, cores and floors. Fires, um, we want to generalize 
D982 to eliminate the limits. Um, and that was kind of talking about restrain versus unrestrain. Um, fire design. Also cores. We really want to take back the cores in steel. That means we want to see more and more projects built with structural steel cores, not concrete cores with structural steel framing around it. And what's been happening um, in the research world, world um, with that as well. And I mentioned before, um, how can we work better with hybrid solutions? Um, we all know that wood is gaining a little bit of traction in, in residential construction. And we all know their residential construction is over 20% of all projects currently starting construction. So is there an opportunity for structural steel to work with wood um, to provide a great hybrid solution? And I'll talk about that a little bit. So I mentioned UL, UL 982. Um, this is um, just an example of something we've been working closely with UL in addition to with the American Iron and Steel Institute. Um, and I encourage you to stay, um, to read Modern Steel Construction. Um, as soon as we have new updates on things such as restrained versus unrestrained, which is no longer an issue, um, we're now looking at other fire scenarios as well on updating the loading um, for the fire test. So now for current modern day loading for LRFD um, and how to update our fire ratings accordingly. So this is something we're going to continue to work with and continue to keep you informed with um, in modern steel construction. Um, also talking about cores. Um, here's an example of World Trade Center 3. Um, the picture here shown on the left, concrete core um, with steel beams and columns. Um, kind of wrapped around this core. And looking at ways such as that composite um, shear wall, so steel plates with concrete inside, also talking about steel plate shear walls, and this is something that we're really looking at pushing more research money and um, working on an updated design guide to provide those thin wall systems. Projects such as this have such a thick core that they're losing um, a lot of those leasable square footage on each floor and gaining back some of that by using a seal option is definitely a viability. Um, so improving the constructability and the ease of design for steel plate shear walls and also bringing composite steel plate walls, steel plate shear walls um, with a concrete and steel sandwich system as part of an option is something that we're moving forward with as well. Um, another thing, we currently have a partnership with SOM um, looking at the concept of um, uh, cross-laminated timber with a steel frame. So look, for example, at a high seismic application. So imagine that you're building a project on the West Coast that is a concrete 15-story um, condo or apartment building. Um, the mass of that structure is huge because of the all-concrete system, which really drives the seismic force, seismic forces and the heavy design that you need. Now, what if we had a solution where we could take advantage of the speed of construction of structural steel and the high size and performance of steel, also keeping the low floor to floor heights, but also bringing in a timber cross laminated timber floor system. So currently we're working on developing a conceptual project where we're looking at steel with cross laminated timber floors to provide viability in something like a high seismic application, even low seismic, to really reduce the weight of your structure by still gaining the efficiencies of steel and timber together. So a great partnership we're excited about and just look forward to more information coming from that moving forward. Let's talk about material innovations that are out there. Um, A913 is not a new specification. It's been a product that's been available overseas for a number of years, and Nucor Yamato Steel Domestic Structural Steel Mill is now starting to roll the initial sections of A913. Um, so they've started some smaller size ranges and hope to have the full size range of all structural steel sections commissioned by late 2017. Um, they currently have a website set up called A913 at nucor yamatocom to ask more questions about ordering, technical questions, material availability. But the whole point is having a high strength steel of 50, 65, and 70 KSI rolled section available domestically um, 
which will be, you know, one of the big advantages, a, a great 50 and 65 that's weldable without preheat um, can really save you a lot of time and money in the field. And having this domest domestically available is a win-win. This product's already been used on a number of projects around the country, um, most notably here in Chicago, our Steel Day tour a year ago, um, of a project on the west side of the loop utilizing A913. Um, so we really anticipate more and more high strength steel, particularly for columns, being used because of this uh, material that's going to be available um, in our own backyard. So that's great. A market that I want to talk about just for a couple minutes is that multi-story residential construction market. When you have over 20 to 25 percent of the market moving forward in this, it's important for you as the designers and the project teams to know how steel can find success and where the successes have been in this market. Currently, the first quarter of 2016 reported that 27% of current construction nationally was in this market, apartments, hotels, condos, student housing, and senior housing. Utilizing structural seal gives the ability to increase ceiling height, reduce building height, or even increase the number of floors. Um, even within that same building envelope, structural steel can meet those needs. Maximizing space with thin floors. Um, systems such as the PECO group um, and shows a um, delta beam as shown here as thin as 8 to 10 inches and spans 25 to over typically 25 feet to well over 30 feet um, with even a thicker system. But 8 to 10 inches um, very thin floor where you're really putting that slab on the bottom flange of your material really helps get you a small nest. Um, another system that can be seen here, that's the PECO system on the left. On the right, you can kind of see this girder slab system, which has been around for a number of years, um, where you're actually sitting precast plank on the bottom of a partially castellated beam where you make a castellated beam, separate into two sections, but instead of welding it back together, you weld a flat bar on the top. And that flat bar, um, then you get grouted over the entire top to really achieve that composite action. Both of these are composite steel and concrete systems, which give you long spans and thin floors. 50% light, lighter weight than the concrete frame. And as you can imagine, if we swap out this floor system for a CLT system, um, as we were talking about in a residential application, we're even going to have a lighter system. And I want to mention before that CLT system, even though it's cross laminated timbers on a steel frame, it still has a very thin coating, um, uh, top coat of concrete to really get, achieve the composite um, system as well. Um, we want to create flexibility also with the concept of long span decks. Long span deck is very similar to the typical uh, metal deck that you use in a concrete or is for a concrete floor in a steel frame office building. Um, this is a concept really of going up to 35 feet without infill beams, 10 to 12 inches deep, and really an interesting application. Um, here's an example, 100 Norfolk Street in New York, New York, really gives you those long spans and the freedom to plan today and into the future, creating versatility and also enhancing the quality. And here's just an example. Um, girder slab, PECO, VersaFloor is that concept of long span um, um, metal deck. There's also other systems, Pueblo, Integrity Wall, Connects Tech is an application of kind of a, a quick modular um, pre-qualified moment connection that really speeds up and removes um, that field welding um, for high seismic applications utilizing um, um, uh, moment frames in uh, high seismic applications for residential construction. And also staggered truss. Staggered truss is something that's used on a variety of projects for residential. Um, most notably, recently in Chicago, the Godfrey Hotel is a great example of the staggered truss hotel, or excuse me, the staggered truss um, system that was developed by MIT in the 1960s. Jumping ships a little bit to sustainability. Um, sustainability is always a hot topic with a lot of innovations and trends, whether it's related to us providing you resources on the current recycled content numbers that you need for your lead documentation, um, to also providing you information 
on the next step. And the next step in innovation we're starting to see is what's called EPDs. And in the current lead version, it discusses having environmental product declarations for a certain number of products in your project. And structural steel, fabricated structural steel sections and fabricated steel plate coming soon as fabricated uh, hollow structural sections, HSS, um, will be published at AISC.org slash EPD or slash sustainability. You can download the AISC environmental product declarations that we've put together. So now when you're looking for your architect or your project owner is requiring EPDs for the project, you know that you can choose structural steel because of the innovations it brings to the table um, and not be limited by it not providing an EPD. Um, so this is an easy way that you have the documentation that's available um, to be able to provide this information back to your project team um, as a, um, a no-nonsense, one-stop um, shop document that really showcases the um, environmental um, qualities and the actual um, information that you need for achieving that, um, that point in your lead rating system. Everything I've talked today are just a wide variety of things that are kind of out there in the market, whether it's an innovation, um, a new trend happening, um, a different product that's available, and you as a decision maker have to kind of funnel all of these things, these things appropriately, and as your project needs change, how do you modify what you provide? And the whole point is remembering that all of these are decisions that impact another, and all of these things can have huge implications um, on the project costs, on the project schedule. And we don't expect you to take this information and be able to say, now I know exactly what to do. We want to be a resource for you. But knowing that AISC is a small piece of the structural steel industry. And the last thing you should have to do is work alone in a silo. Um, but it's better really to work with the entire project team. It's important to know that you can reduce your risk um, by working together with your structural steel fabricators, with AISC, um, and asking lots of questions early, like, is girder slab right for me? Um, is long span metal deck the best application for this type of challenge that I have? Or can I get um, the information or the material I need for this type of system. And asking those questions early is only the, the best way to reduce your risk. And there's a lot of different ways that are out, uh, different challenges that are out there that are impacted by the market conditions, the market environment, such as you know, the sustainability concerns are always evolving. What we say in sustainability right now is completely different than what we said five years ago, even different than what we said a year ago. And then what is the competition that's out there? Um, there's increasing competition from wood, concrete, even foreign competition within structural steel. So how you handle all of the different factors, whether it's the market, the environment, um, or just the conditions that are out there in our, in our global economy, how do you kind of um, make the best decision that's out there? And really the best solution that we have for you is teaming up with a structural steel fabricator um, early on to answer and help you combat these, um, you know, these challenging waters ahead that we have. We always note that overall, the construction economy is more successful when people work together. And whether it's design build versus CM at risk versus design bid build, overall, the more we can collaborate, even if it isn't a true design build environment, the more success we have by answering questions now rather than after bid date when the changes are only going to cost more money for everyone. The thing to appreciate is structural steel is not a commodity, it's a specialty product. And the key to that expertise is the fabricator answering questions and concerns you might have. Um, it's really the opportunity to exercise influence in a project early in the design. So even if you don't have a contractual relationship with the fabricator, Asking questions early about connections, material availability, system optimization. What's the best way to skin this cat of my project? Because remember, just because you've used steel before, maybe you have, maybe you haven't. Every project is very unique in getting that expertise. 
The things it brings to the table is thinking about things outside the box. Can we do modular panelized construction? Can we guarantee a price up front? Can we reduce our risk by controlling our risk? What about quality and safety? How can we reduce the concerns of um, quality and bring more improvements to safety on our jobs? And understanding what the long-term steel brings to the, to the table. The whole point to appreciate is early involvement is only successful um, when everyone's sitting at, at the table early on, and that really is the golden ticket to success. The thing I want you to do next is really get, sit back and your, go back to your jobs after steel day and look at your projects and say, have I evaluated this for a steel option? Do I really understand the constraints on how I can optimize um, something that maybe somebody else has done before? Um, the last thing you want you to do is to approach something um, when somebody else has already done it before, we want you to learn those lessons learned and be able to translate that to you. Have you called your local fabricator to discuss project constraints? Um, what sustainable needs do you have? And what do you need to help achieve them? Is this something that we can partner with you to assist on? Have I looked at any, ex have I explored the innovations on my project? And is this different than what I've done be from before? And have I reached out to the Steel Solution Center for my job? AISC's Steel Solution Center is a one-stop shop for you. Based in Chicago, teaming up with our regional engineers around the country, technical experts from all around the world to help write our documents, we are here to provide assistance to you as providing technical assistance, conceptual solutions, and innovative ideas as a one-stop shop for everything that you need related to structural steel. Once a year, we update a document called our Innovative Structural Steel Systems to dive into more things such as the PACO system. Um, here's an example of girder slab. What about thermal brake solutions, um, which are called mechanical thermal brake assemblies? Um, we also look at new and interesting modular solutions to steel, new material grades that are coming out. Going to AISC.org slash solutions the Steel Solutions Center website has a one-stop shop to download what are these innovative solutions that are out there for your next project. Our staff in the Solutions Center is well equipped with a vast, wide range of experience um, to assist you on your next project, in addition to with the regional engineers lo located across the country that can even come into your projects, um, com come into your um, company's uh, lunch and learn pre presentations, and even come in when you have project specific questions and challenges related to framing solutions, spec challenges with AESS, or even sustainability constraints. We are here to team you up with fabricators in your local area that can provide that valuable one-on-one -on -one assistance to you for understanding local market conditions, local constructability concerns, and really helping your project reduce that risk by using structural steel. This week on Steel Day is also a great opportunity to vote for the Ideas Award winning projects that are being nominated currently. Our 2017 Ideas, Ideas projects are currently being balloted. If you log on to our Facebook page or simply to AISC.org slash Ideas2, you'll be taken to a place where you can actually vote for your favorite projects, possibly some that you've nominated yourself through your project teams and learn about the great projects that will be featured in the next calendar year as successful applications of structural steel utilized in the, in the past year in the United States. With that, I would like to say Happy Steel Day. September 30th, 2016 is the day this year that we recognize the vast, amazing accomplishments structural steel has made over the last 90 plus years of AISC even since structural steel buildings first started being built in the late 19th century. Structural steel is prevalent in high-rise construction, it's prevalent in low-rise construction, it's prevalent in miscellaneous metals, and a variety, wide variety of innovations are being utilized on projects all around the world. If you didn't have an opportunity to tour a project site today or tour a fabrication shop, please reach out to us and we'd be glad to notify you of when the next one happens in your local area. 
With that, thank you so much for your time. Happy Steel Day, and don't ever hesitate to reach out to us throughout the year at AISC.org. Thank you again.